Okay, so let's just jump into it. How long have you been doing these surgeries? And I'm talking about the 600 pound surgeries. Oh, you mean the uh, overweight people? Oh, the over, over. The, the, like, the super, that came from a list, the super um, morbid obesity. I started that uh, when I started my practice. Oh, and that was how long ago? If I tell you, everybody thinks I should be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it couldn't have been that long ago because you're only 50, right? Right? Yeah, right. 50. 50. Yes, we're going to yeah. go with that number. It's a good number. Okay. okay, so since the, the conception of your practice, you've always focused on the morbidly obese. Yeah, I, we did a training um, in uh, general surgery. We did a lot of weight loss surgery. And so the early days, back in early 70s, uh, we did the... Um, and jejuning your bypass, so that's the operation that we don't do anymore. Uh, but when I started my practice, uh, I took care of all the patients, regardless how heavy they were. Regardless of how heavy they were, which is not what a lot of doctors do today. They have cutoffs. Well, uh, it wasn't very easy on those days. Um, and they were limiting everybody about 350 pounds. Anybody over 350 pounds was considered to be a high risk to have surgery. Okay. But and these are the people that they need more, the most uh, the most operations. So we need to find a way to help them. So I figured out uh, how we can help these people. It was an uphill battle. So you have to go to convince the hospital administration to go extra mile and provide the beds that you can put the people 500, 600 pounds. Those days, we didn't have a bed that would go over 400 pounds. And so that was a challenge to get a bed for these people. Then it was a challenge to convince the anesthesiology that these people need help and you need to put them to sleep. And then there was a challenge of getting the operating table because the operating table on those days will go up to 400. So it's obstacle after obstacle from yeah. the facility to convincing the anesthesiologist that take the risk on these patients. So Correct. you had an army that you had to convince just to try to get your patients help. Well, uh, it was a, you know, the uh, a situation that these people need to be helped and we shouldn't discriminate against these people and, um, and they need the most help and we shouldn't turn them down. So this was the situation that I felt like we have to provide care for these people. Do you find it still, right? So you started advocating for us 40 years ago. How much easier is it now as far as discrimination amongst your peers um, when they talk to you about taking on these patients right now? I can tell you it hasn't changed. The challenge is right now even harder than then. I get every day criticized for taking care of this patient. I get every day battled with the same factor that I battled before, but fortunately now we got the bed that we can go up a thousand and we can do all those things, but it still is um, a lot of issue with it. One of the issues we get in, um, you have to consider that these people are very high risk and most of these people are in disability and the current reimbursement is not very good for paying this thing. So a lot of people, they shy away taking care of them. So because they don't have the facility and because it costs a lot of money and then their insurance doesn't pay well. Yeah, uh, you know, one time I took care of one of the patients uh, that was like 800 pounds and we did surgery, we kept him in the hospital. By the time that uh, the insurance paid and everything was deductible and this and this, they sent me a check for 97 cents. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And but you knew that was a risk and you did it anyways. Yeah, and you know, the, the, the financial thing is uh, one aspect that many uh, doctors will shy away from taking care of these patients. But, and they take an enormous amount of time and you have to devote a lot of time for them and the reimbursement is not enough. Uh, and that's one situation. And the other aspect is that these are high risk and sometimes they are too risky for the skill of some people 
And there's the issue that if um, you're not skilled enough and you take care of this patient, something goes wrong and you lose a patient, then you're going to doubt your ability. Mm. And that's going to be a very uh, harsh thing for them to tackle. So you have to have ability to take care of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have to be ready to work with all the obstacles around the case and uh, try to help these people. And you shouldn't discriminate about their weight, and you shouldn't discriminate about that. But then uh, there's also another issue. My colleague, they would come in and they said, why are you taking care of this patient? They ate themselves to death, and you're taking care of them. And I keep explaining to them, this is not their choice. This is a metabolic and genetic predisposition for these people. They have no choice, mm. and they don't understand that. But this is a disease beyond their control. Mm -hmm. And they right. need to take care of it. And no matter how many times you explain to them that this is not because of lack of discipline, this is not because they eat themselves to death, this is a disease that they have no control over. Mm. And metabolic difference in between somebody that is healthy and is 150 pounds is totally different than a person that's 600 pounds. And for that reason, when we operate on these people, and if you look at the beginning of 600 pounds show, I said that our success rate is 5%. Did you guys hear that? The success rate of the patients on this show that he's been tracking is 5%. Okay, explain to us why that is, doctor. Well, it, it, we're looking at about success in 10 years. Okay, these people, when we operate on them, we change their metabolism and they lose weight. And they go down, 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 but the, um, the faulty metabolism that creates the situation will repair itself. Did you understand that? So not only are they doing operation physically on the stomach, but it changes their metabolism. So after five years? Yeah, usually, you know what happened when we operate this patient? We change all the gastrointestinal hormone that drive their metabolism. Okay. goes down to zero. The insulin resistance goes down to zero. So it's not just the size of our stomach that you're changing that affects how much we eat. It's actually you're changing our metabolism. That's correct. I'll explain that why we're talking about revision and okay. all those things. So what happened when we operate on them? Just people metabolism changes because we manipulate one of the GI hormones okay. that control their appetite, that insulin resistance. But about a year after surgery, that hormone starts secreting from other sources in gastrointestinal system, mm. and in five years become the same level. As before surgery. As before the surgery. And the, wow. why does people five years after surgery, they're gonna have the same drive, the same metabolism, and if they were eating the same amount they ate after first year, in five years, they're going to start gaining weight. And that, did, did that just make a lot of you feel at least better that it's not necessarily your, it's not your fault? After five years, right? How all of us at five years hit that point where we start to regain. So Dr. Now is saying it's because our metabolism has regenerated the same, at the same strength it was before surgery. Correct. So that means that we have to work 10 times harder than the person who has the what, more functioning metabolism, the faster metabolism? Well, there is more to it. I'll explain okay. that to it. But uh, see what happened 20 years ago. Everybody I saw after five years, weight gaining, oh, your patch is getting bigger. We're going to go ahead and do the revision and you're going to go right. We operate on these people. They made the patch we thought it was bigger, we made it smaller. They lost weight for a year, five years down the road. They were back to the same. Our revision success in five years that I studied was zero. Oh. Zero. So we find out that it was not size of the patch that was causing this problem. It was the metabolic repair that those people reverting to the same pathological genetic disposition that they had beginning. Wow. So I explained that in my book, and if somebody gets that, please read it, and you'll understand what's going on. So that's one reason that the revision is really is something that people 
hoping that it's going to change the situation and going to start losing weight. But the revision is going to have a temporary effect. Mm. Okay? So everything bear down the metabolic changes. So to begin with, you have to understand, everybody got different metabolism. Mm -hmm. Your weight is like a bank account, okay? The money you put in is just like a food you eat. Okay. The, the bill you spend, write the check, is like the energy you spend to live. Okay. So everybody got different budget. Mm -hmm. So everybody got different metabolism. Mm -hmm. So you can't take and everybody and tell them that 1,200 calories is gonna be good for you. You have to figure out what their metabolism is, how much calories they need, and what they need so to like do. So like that 1,200 standard is not standard for everybody. No, it's and a, like in real life, effect. we all want more money in our account. We all want more calories to spend. Well, you know, right. some, some people live in inherent in dollar, and some people live in twenty thousand so, dollars. But you know, this is the same thing Got with it. the metabolism. So everybody is different. But here's the issue that everybody misses about this thing. You have to understand there are two components that we're working with. One is your metabolism that we can't change except with the surgery and some medication. In the book, I call it endogenous factor. Endogenous factor. The other one is the environmental factor. Okay. Environmental factor is your eating habit. What is affected? You know, fast food, did it say enabler in your family, did mm. it element of depression, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people emotional eating, mm -hmm. all those factors are within our control. Mm -hmm. And those need to be corrected before we consider the surgery. The surgery will work on a component of metabolism, mm -hmm. but would not change your behavior toward what is wrong with your eating habits. So do I hear that the key to long-term success is not only understanding your metabolism, but also um, identifying those environmental factors that contribute to our weight gain. That's correct. What I tell my patients that there are three factors that control your eating habits. Okay. One is your frequency of eating. Frequency of eating. Are we okay. on this? Write this down. In 24 hours. In a 24 hour period. So the okay. first one is our frequency of eating in a 24 hour period. And I'll call that F. F. Okay. Then is amount of food you eat in one meal. I call that A. A, so for the amount, quantity. And then is the type of food you eat. I call it T. T. Are you guys on to us? That yeah. means fat. <laughs> right, and the type of food. Type of food. Okay. So all these three factors is contributing to your calorie intake in the day. You need to figure out what's wrong with your frequency of eating, what's wrong with your amount of eating, mm -hmm. what's wrong with your type of food you're eating. Unless you understand that before surgery, after surgery, the surgery will give you a tool to change those components. If you're not knowing what is your issues, mm -hmm. you don't know how to change it. T talk to us about the story, the story that you had shared with me earlier about um, how you tracked some of the patients who were sort of omitting some of the stuff they were eating. Like, you know, I have those patients who were like, I gained five pounds, but I swear I stood on track all week. How they like literally don't admit how much they're intaking. Well, you know, the, first of all, there is a blanket idea. I took, uh, 10 years ago, I did a study on 100 people, asking before surgery, what do you think is cause of your obesity? I had everything under the sun except I ate too much. Do you guys hear that? Isn't that okay. fantastic? I am in my period. I don't <laughs> exercise. Uh, I eat late, uh, it must be my work, I, I don't cook, I, I this, at least goes, goes on and on. But could it be uh, you, eat, you too eat too much? much. No, 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 that could Never. not be. I got this story in, uh, in my book, uh, calling Mr. Jones, I came and saw me. And uh, he came and brought his wife, and his wife was like uh, 370 pounds, and he went to weight loss surgery. So I said, okay, uh, what seems to be a problem? Well, the problem is she doesn't eat very much, okay? So if she doesn't eat very much, why does she need surgery? Because she wants to lose weight. Well, if she doesn't eat very much, how can she be 370 pounds? So hey, I can tell you, she doesn't eat very much. Okay, I said, how do you think the surgery is gonna change that? 
And well, if you're going to make it lose weight, or how? Well, it could be because uh, we're going to make it eat less. Yeah. So if she eats less, she loses weight. Can we conclude that she's eating too much now? No. You don't <laughs> eat she doesn't eat very much. So you explain that. Next time he comes, he bring everybody, including his neighbor's dog. Say, you can ask him. <laughs> he doesn't eat very much. So the, the denial that we're eating too much is a, a first step for the failure. Because, you know, everybody thinks, hey, we're going to go down this road, we're going to lose weight. How? You need to understand how you're going to change your eating habit. If you don't know what's wrong with your eating habit, how are you going to correct it? Mm -hmm. It's like having a puzzle, and you don't know what the puzzle is, you want to solve it? That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue that we need to work on it. And you know, the, the other thing is, um, I got the book, I gave it to 20 of my colleagues, I asked them something about it, nobody read it. And that's a, that's a situation that you deal with the situation that people, they don't want to go there. They judge the people, and they say this is lack of discipline, these people, they brought it themselves, and we shouldn't take care of them, we shouldn't take it, let's take care of them. But that's not the whole issue. And these people are in a situation that they need help, and we shouldn't discriminate against them, and we shouldn't bias about them, and we shouldn't judge these people, mm. okay? And that's a problem that we have been with mm -hmm. so, so you're not only advocating and teaching us how to live healthier lives, you're really t teaching your colleagues and really trying to influence your colleagues to, uh, your colleagues to understand this population. Well, you know, that's, a, that's a, 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 a continuous education for everybody. And the reason I started this uh, uh, TV series was to impress the the medical community that they should take care of all these uh, mobility patients, and then also to sort of uh, to have a so inspiration for the people mm -hmm. and for medical community, so they change the bias opinion about morbidly obese people. How do you feel that it's affected your colleagues, the ones that you know have watched it? Do you think it's had a, a positive effect? Well, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not working as well the way as I, I was hoping. They still um, discriminate. They're still very biased about these people. They still are always criticizing me for taking care of them. So that has not changed. But, you know, you have to stay, and you persist with what you're doing, and you hope everybody is going to understand one day. And this is something that we need to spread the message that obesity is not patient's choice, mm. okay? That's a metabolic and a genetic disposition that these people have. And this is a disease and need to be treated as a disease. Mm -hmm. And they keep saying that, oh, fast food is the cause of obesity. Um, you know, the regulation, like uh, putting tax on the sugary food or control side of the thing, yes. is not going to change individual behavior toward their eating habit. Did you guys get that? So if McDonald's takes away the big gulp cup, it's not going to change us getting two medium cups, I guess, is what you're saying, right? The behavior. Everything has to be a positive campaign for the... Uh, making everybody be healthier mm -hmm. and be more proactive about improving their life. Not to criticize people, not to say that demonize the food industry for individual behavior, mm -hmm. okay? So we have to be responsible for our behavior and mm -hmm. we have to make the changes. So personal responsibility becomes the first issue. Mm -hmm. And that's just one reason uh, before I do any kind of surgery, I insist that people change their behavior. And what do you do to insist that? You make them go where? Well, we make them to lose weight. Okay. Uh, we change their eating habits. Okay. We put them on some medication, and we're going to work with them, and we require that they're going to make those changes before the surgery. I've and seen you send them to a therapist. All of them, they need to see a psychotherapist. Okay. All of them, they need to have issues to to 
work with the therapist to figure out what issue they got that stress eating is causing them to eat. Mm -hmm. But that's one aspect. But then if you get somebody that every time they get depressed, they eat, every time they get mad, they get, mm -hmm. every time they eat, you give them surgery, you take him that food comfort away from them. Mm -hmm. You gotta have profound personality change. Mm -hmm. These people, they go to divorce, they, they become hostile, they change their behavior, they become alcoholic. And we or take something. away their food and we get, become hostile? They do. <laughs> a little bit. And then we deal with cross addiction, right? A lot of our, a lot of patients, I say R as a therapist and a patient, I see the cross addiction. So we take away your food and you're doing great with the, the diet, but then we pick up the alcohol. Then we pick up the shopping, and we're more promiscuous. There's, we, we compensate if we don't deal with those environmental issues like you suggested, right? That's correct. And then that's why we want them then to see a therapist before mm -hmm. and make sure they understand when they have that food comfort taken from them, mm -hmm. their coping mechanism has to be changed. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be a big factor for mm -hmm. them. So they need uh, to understand all the issues that they have mm -hmm. and how they're gonna change all those things, how their life is gonna be, because this is something that is not only eating habits. Mm -hmm. It's entire their behavior has to change. Absolutely, okay. and, I, and I think when I heard you talk about the show, and the, although it hasn't influenced your colleagues in as big of a way that you hoped, I know for a fact it has influenced the public and their perception um, of obese patients, right? You have, you, along with your very vulnerable um, patients who have been so gracious into letting us follow this journey that is so shameful for so many of us, um, it shed light, and I follow the boards, and I know that a lot of people are like, thank you for sharing that, or even people who don't have weight problems follow it and say, wow, I have a completely new take on those, and, and you know, when I see that person coming through the elevator, I'm gonna treat them differently because of your show. And so I wanna thank you on behalf of myself and the public for, for doing that for us, because it's a big deal. And I'm, I've, always, I've always said that I feel like uh, we're one of the most discriminated against because people think we can control it. You know, you can't control the color of your skin, you can't control if you have special needs, you can't control certain other things that we are, you know, um, forced to deal with. But when they see an obese person, we, we're, you know, disgusting to a lot of people. I keep saying we because I still feel like I'm that, you know, over 100 pounds more than I am now. And it'll always be something dear to my heart. So again, I wanna, you know, thank you for doing that for us. Um, we are going to, we're gonna just take a couple minutes to ask you guys, just we have time for just a couple of questions from you guys. So I'm gonna have a runner go out there. Um, again, we just, I'm, to see the time, we're having so much fun, it went by so fast. So in just a couple minutes, we're gonna also bring up Am Amber and Melissa, but. Who has a question for Dr. Nels Arden? Anybody have a question for, we have one way in the back, so we're gonna make you run in those shoes, Lauren. With an only 5% um, success rate, how do you choose your patients? Hmm. What's your selection process like, doctor? Um, I don't have any selection process. Everybody comes to divorce, and we take care of them. Wow. So, so he says everyone comes to the door and he takes care of them. So you guys saw Christina that was up here earlier. She literally did not have an appointment with Dr. Nelzard, and she drove to his office without an appointment, and he took her on the spot. Right. We have another, another question from the audience. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, right behind you. Go ahead. What's been the major um, difference between the 5% that have succeeded and the 95 that have failed? Mm. The, the difference between the 5% that um, succeeded. What did they do that the other 95 didn't do? Well, you know, it's going to be a constant challenge. And here's the situation. I take a 500-pound person get them to figure out what's wrong with their eating habit, and I'm able to get them down to 170 without surgery. What did that tell you? That if you understand what the issues are, you can solve them. 
But if you refuse to figure out what's wrong and you want a solution without knowing what the problem is, you're going to be setting up for failure. You're going to fall in that 95% if you don't fix the real problem because the weight is a symptom of our problem. Yeah. That's all depend on ability to understand what the problem is mm. and what the solution is. And it's not that surgery is going to give you a solution. Surgery is a tool that is going to give you an opportunity to correct the problem. But if you don't know what the problem is, you will never going to be able to correct it. Long term. Okay. But there are people that are getting to analyze their eating habit every day. I give them the paper and it says read these every morning and you analyze what's wrong with your eating habit. Nine out of ten come in, you can't get anything out of them. What's wrong with the eating habit? Nothing. But then there are a few people that they do their work and they come in and say, okay, my problem is when I'm stressed, I eat. I eat it late at night. And when I get the upset, I eat. And I have and enablers. Enabler said, and my wife cooks. If I don't eat it, she gets upset. You know, all those things. So then you get them to solve those problems, and they can change their life. Um, last year, we did the skin tight show. There were two characters over there, both men. Uh, both men, they lost over 400 pounds with diet only, no surgery. Wow. No surgery. So if you figure out what the problem is, the solution is not always a surgery. You have to know what's wrong over there to know how to correct it. So you do the hard work, you do the head work, the emotional work, and that's going to help you be in that 5%. That is correct.